You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Hello and welcome to episode 326 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Kovart. Just about two months ago, Russia invaded Ukraine, an Eastern European country with a coastline along the Black Sea, and a nation that had once been a member of the Soviet Union. At the time of the Russian invasion, Ukraine was a democratic republic, and a nation that was in the process of seeking admission to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. For the last two months, Americans have been thinking about Ukraine. With Ukrainian sovereignty and democracy under attack, Americans have been wondering, should our government be doing more than placing economic sanctions on Russia? Should I, as a U.S. military veteran, travel to Ukraine and offer to fight in their army? And what would official U.S. military involvement in Ukraine mean for the politics of Europe and in our age of nuclear weapons? While the situation in Ukraine is new and novel, Americans' desire to assist other nations seeking to create and preserve their democracies and republics is not new. During the 1820s, the Greek Revolution and fight for independence from the Ottoman Empire had many early Americans considering similar questions to the ones that we're thinking about today. Maureen Connor Santelli, an associate professor of history at Northern Virginia Community College, joins us to investigate the Greek Revolution and early Americans' reaction to it. Maureen has written a book on this topic. It's called The Greek Fire, American Ottoman Fervor in the Age of Revolutions. Now, as we investigate the Greek Revolution, Maureen reveals details about the Greek Revolution and its place within the larger Age of Revolutions, early Americans' interest in the Greek cause for independence, and information about Americans' two responses to the Greek Revolution, their official response and their unofficial response. But first, as we chat with Maureen, I hope you will think about and recognize some of the parallels between this episode in early American history and the present situation in Ukraine. Unfortunately, you will not hear Maureen or I bring up these parallels as we recorded this episode before the Russian invasion. Still, as I edited this episode together, I couldn't help but identify and think about parallels that I saw between these two historic situations. It really enriched my listening and piqued my curiosity and I think it'll do the same for you. All right, are you ready to head into the early 19th century? Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is an associate professor of history at Northern Virginia Community College. She's a historian of the early American Republic, with research specialties in diplomacy and reform during the 19th century. She's held fellowships, written articles, and she's published a book, The Greek Fire, American Ottoman Fervor in the Age of Revolutions. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Maureen Connor Santelli. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Maureen, it's really great to have you here. Now, I know we're going to talk about the Greek Revolution and early Americans' response to it, but before we dive into early Americans' response to the Greek Revolution, I really think it would help if we had some context. So between 1763 and 1848, the Atlantic world of Africa, Europe, North America, South America, and the Caribbean seemed to erupt in revolutions. Now, as participants in the first revolution in this age of revolution, Americans really took a strong interest in all the different subsequent revolutions that were going on during this age. And in her book, The Greek Fire, Maureen demonstrates how and why Americans showed a particular interest in the Greek Revolution, which took place between the 1820s and 1830s. So Maureen, now that we have that little bit of context in place, could you tell us about the Greek Revolution and its place within this larger age of revolution? Yeah, so the Greek Revolution begins officially in March 1821. And it lasts for the duration of the 1820s. The ideas that informed the origins of the Greek Revolution, and much like the other revolutions of the period, revolve around ideas regarding citizenship, 
national identity, liberty, equality, fraternity. And all of these ideas, of course, first sprang from the Enlightenment. The American and French revolutions demonstrated that, at least in part, these ideals are obtainable goals rather than just merely utopian ideals. And many new nation states throughout the 19th century, of course, will emerge as a result of this inspiration. The ideals of the Greek Revolution were put into motion by Greek intellectuals and merchants who were largely educated in Europe. We see important Greek intellectuals such as Adamantios Coriis in places like France, speaking with Thomas Jefferson on the subject of Greek identity and the possibility of overthrowing Ottoman rule in Greece. The American and French revolutions in the ideals of nationalism further gave strength to the possibility of these arguments in Greece. So the idea that the Greeks have this shared history, language, religion, all further solidified a desire for independence to cease being rea or subjects within the Ottoman Empire and to instead be Hellenes, which is this term that's associated with their ancient Greek past. The Philiki Eteria was one of several secret societies that supported the idea of Greek nationhood and professed these Enlightenment and nationalist principles. Their efforts will ultimately set the course for the start of the revolution in Greece. And while there was global support for the ideals of the Enlightenment and the application of these ideas in the Age of Revolutions, the Greek Revolution seemed to especially fulfill these ideas because of their link with ancient Greece and that the United States, Great Britain, Germany, France, all identified with that heritage. So early Americans were especially invested in the Greek Revolution for those reasons. When we talk about the American Revolution, right, we have this understanding that revolutionaries were not only tired of paying taxes, but that they wanted independence from what they saw as a corrupt and tyrannical government under King and Parliament. And it sounds like the Greek revolutionaries might have hoped for something different in their quest to secure independence from the Ottoman Empire. Would you tell us about the Ottoman Empire and its style of governance that it sounds like the Greeks really came to dislike? The Ottoman Empire was this expansive empire that was ethnically as well as religiously diverse. It's, of course, not just a Muslim empire. The Greeks, of course, are Orthodox Christian. There's other Christians within it, and there's other religious groups. When we say the Ottoman Empire, we are talking about modern-day Turkey, moving into the Balkan Peninsula. This includes Greece, moving into portions of Eastern Europe. They had also essentially provinces that were loosely connected with them called the Barbary States. This is the northern coast of Africa which actually posed some problems for the sultan because some of his governors, although they are supposed to bear allegiance to the sultan, they are technically kind of sort of separate. So Muhammad Ali Pasha, the governor of Egypt, he wants greater autonomy. So we have a sultan who is trying to manage some unruly governors who want greater autonomy. You also have the Greeks, the Serbs, and other groups who are inspired by ideals of nationalism. They want autonomy as well. So the sultan is struggling to maintain this expansive empire and has internal as well as external pressures mounting on top of him. In addition to all of this, we have the children of Greek merchants who had gained educations in places like Paris, had imported Enlightenment ideas into Greek communities within the Ottoman Empire, they are articulating interest in reviving a Greek identity as based in their ancient origins. So the Ottomans are up against a lot of new ideas that are circulating throughout the empire. Subjects within the Ottoman Empire were known as rea. Minority groups, such as Christian Greeks, were further classified as zimis. These are protected minorities within the Ottoman state. Under this status, Greeks could not be enslaved only through rebellion or support of a belligerent power against the Islamic State could Greeks be put to death or enslaved. 
In return for accepting subordinate status, Greeks were granted freedom of worship and of property. So Christian Greeks were part of the bureaucracy of the Ottoman Empire and occupied important positions within it, but could not ascend to the highest offices within the empire. So we have some of these Greek intellectuals informed by Enlightenment principles, informed by ideas of nationalism. They're building these ideas that, you know, we're Greek, we're not Ottoman. They also are barred from ascending to some of these higher offices or having, you know, opportunities that maybe they want within the Ottoman state. So the idea of securing Greek independence is increasingly becoming more and more attractive. Even though the context is different, I think we can see how early Americans may have seen a bit of themselves in the Greek fight for independence. You know, you have this Ottoman Empire, which is this empire that was really having a hard time controlling all of its territories. And this was the situation in Great Britain, right, that led to the American Revolution, that after the Seven Years' War in 1763, Great Britain is having a hard time managing and integrating all these new territories into its empire. And that's what caused all of the acts of taxation and other types of acts that moved the Americans to declare independence. But it also sounds like there were important differences between these two causes, the American Revolution and the Greek Revolution. For example, you know, in the American Revolution, it was the case that Americans really thought themselves to be the equals of Britons in the United Kingdom, so equal subjects in the British Empire. And they argued that they had a revolution in part because England didn't view them that way. Whereas the Greeks know they're not full subjects of the empire, that they are subordinates of the Ottoman Empire, and that this status isn't going to change unless they stage a revolution. So yeah, the similarities and differences between these two events and how early Americans might have perceived them are just kind of running through my brain. Like, how did early Americans really perceive the Greek Revolution and how much of this were they projecting about their experiences with fighting an empire for independence? Yeah, in terms of similarities and differences, maybe some of the immediate reasons for wanting independence from the Ottoman Empire are different from early Americans. But certainly in terms of wanting to oppose a perceived tyranny and to embrace independence and liberty to have a republic are similar in that way. And I think that for early Americans, that's what they saw as being similar. And they wanted to aid the Greeks in not only securing a republic in the similar vein that the United States had secured, but the United States felt that the Greeks were perhaps the most deserving of such a republic because of their ancient contributions to the origins of democracy. Now, how did Americans perceive the influence of the American Revolution on the Greek Revolution? And what was the actual reality of this perception? For example, if we look at the history of Switzerland, the Swiss held a revolution in the late 1790s and again in the 1830s. And while the Swiss knew about the American Revolution, its real influence came from the French Revolution and its revolt against the Ancien Regime. They weren't really inspired at all by the American Revolution, even if they were fighting for similar things as the American Revolution. So what role, if any role, did the American Revolution play in influencing the Greek Revolution? In looking at the sources and what these Greek intellectuals had to say, I do think that the French Revolution was probably more immediately persuasive to the origins of their ideas, the ideas that they're talking about in the Philoki Eteria. However, they recognized the usefulness that early Americans might serve in supporting the Greek Revolution. And while certainly there's no doubt that the American Revolution did influence the Greek Revolution, I think that they perhaps played up the influence of the American Revolution to a greater degree than it was in reality in order to sustain that interest from early America. Because at the end of the day, the Greeks really do need to have an acknowledgement of their independence from the Ottomans and support for their venture. Let's get into some of the details of the Greek Revolution and early Americans' interest in this event. How did Americans become aware and interested in the Greek Revolution? Greece is not a neighbor to North America. It's pretty far away. So how did Americans learn about 
the Greek Revolution? So early Americans, right from the get-go after the American Revolution is secured, they, of course, are exploring new ideas regarding who are they and what is their foundational identity going to be based upon. Early Americans had tried to distance themselves from their Britishness and tried to embrace a new type of identity. So we see in the late 1700s, this interest in embracing an ancient origin of history and identity as steeped in the Roman Republic. Over time, we start to see an increasing interest in not just the Roman Republic, but also in Greece and in democracy. We especially see this evolving into the 19th century. Part of this inspiration comes from Napoleon's conquests in the Mediterranean. So we have you know, knowledge of some of these antiquities that are being discovered, and this sort of captures the imaginations of both early Americans and Europeans alike. We also have the controversy over Lord Elgin and the Parthenon marbles, which is an explosive controversy even in our modern moment. These are marbles that once decorated the Parthenon, the great Parthenon in Athens, this ancient structure. Lord Elgin purchased these marbles from the Ottomans and removed them from the Parthenon and took them to Britain. And famous Philhellenes such as Lord Byron, but also American Philhellenes such as Edward Everett were unhappy about this. And of course, this is the idea of ancient Greece is generating a lot of attention there as well. So Greco-Roman antiquities in both Europe and the United States had sort of captured people's imaginations. We also, by the 1820s, have the emerging changes in voting restrictions. So we have, moving into the 1820s, universal white male suffrage in a number of the states. Lord Byron's poetry. Lord Byron, of course, is this important romantic British poet who famously traveled to Greece, wrote about his adventures there, connected it with the the loss of the ancient glories of Greece, and ignited this very romantic interest in Greece, and not just in Greece's ancient past, but helping the Greeks to reclaim that history from the Ottomans and their rule over Greece. So early Americans not only are caught up in this romantic movement, but They also believed that they had a special connection to ancient Greece. They felt an almost civic obligation to supporting Greek independence because they believed out of any of the European powers, the United States had successfully, in their perspective, secured a republic that did not encounter some of the problems that the French Revolution had. And so they know they have experience And it's their duty to help the Greeks also secure such a republic. So it sounds like early Americans had an interest in Greece that really long predated the Greek Revolution. So when the Greek Revolution does come along, Americans are really already inclined to take an interest in it. Yeah, the principles of Philhellenism, this international movement that was not only professed a romantic view towards ancient Greece, but also this desire for Greece to become independent from the Ottoman Empire. There is evidence of this going back way before the 1820s. There are early American poems, even some novels that mention, at least in passing, this interest in Greece obtaining its independence. Perhaps one of the most famous early Philhellenes, if we can go ahead and use the term this early on, is Thomas Jefferson, who, while in Paris as a diplomat, met an important Greek intellectual. This is Adamantios Coriis. Jefferson called him Cory, but he was a Greek intellectual that Jefferson conversed with. His imagination was sort of ignited by not only the idea that maybe Greece could gain independence from the Ottoman Empire, but he wrote to friends about how, oh, the Greeks not only could secure independence, but maybe they could modify their modern language to readopt the ancient Greek language. So his imagination was certainly ignited by some of these ideals about reclaiming 
the ancient Greek past. And again, a lot of these sentiments are repeated by other early Americans during the Greek Revolution and their support for it. You know, when we think about these revolutions, there's always an event that seems to kick them off. In the case of the American Revolution, you know, we usually point to the shot heard around the world at Lexington Green in April 1775. And when we talk about the French Revolution, there's a storming of the Bastille. What was this equivalent starting moment for the Greek Revolution? Was there a moment that early Americans would have heard or read about in their newspapers that said, oh, wow, there's a revolution going on in Greece? The Greek Revolution officially begins in March 1821. Reports of the rebellion arrived in the United States beginning in May of 1821. The head of the Philiki Etaria, the said secret Greek society, the leader of that society at this point was a man by the name of Alexandros Ypsilantes. He was a member of a prominent Greek family with Russian imperial connections. Ypsilanti's plan for the rebellion included inciting a conflict from within regions known as Wallachia and Moldavia, where many Greeks lived at this point. This insurrection would then join with plans for insurrection within Greece itself. Ypsilanti's issued two declarations which were printed in international newspapers. And so these reprinted declarations arrive in the United States right in around May and then are printed nationwide. We have you know, the article being printed in both New England and then on down into the southern United States. The declarations romantically talked about why the Greeks deserve independence, connecting it with their ancient past, that Europe could thank Greece for bringing to the world democracy and all of these contributions that they made within the classical Greek period, that they should support the Greeks as a result. And again, early Americans almost immediately felt like, well, we of all of these places have a better understanding of what the Greeks are going through. So almost immediately, we start to see early Americans talking about it. We have public opinion articles talking about Greek independence in the newspapers. Poems are being written to support Greek independence. And there was this sort of expectation right away that the United States government would acknowledge Greek independence right from the get-go. Another similarity to note here is that, much like France during the American Revolution, the United States actually had two different responses to the Greek Revolution. One was the official response from the United States government, and the other was an unofficial response from the American people. Maureen, let's start with the official United States government response. Would you tell us about President James Monroe and the context in which he received all of this news coming out of the Greek Revolution? James Monroe was an ardent supporter for revolutions in the world, very much interested in hearing about, you know, like the age of revolutions, Latin American revolutions. And so he, from the get-go, is very much in favor of supporting Greek independence. However, his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, had very different ideas. He thought that supporting Greek independence from the get-go would be a bad choice, both diplomatically as well as commercially. He envisioned that the United States was going to finally be able to secure a commercial treaty with the Ottomans, and by supporting a rebellion within the Ottoman Empire, was obviously going to prevent that commercial treaty from being secured. So from 1821 until the end of 1823, James Monroe and John Quincy Adams kind of go round and round about this. And I think that James Monroe really tried to hold out on this. I think that Monroe really wanted to entertain some way that the United States could at least show some gesture of support for the Greeks. And John Quincy Adams talks with other cabinet members who also are at their core Philhellenes. They want Greece to have independence. And he basically says to them, it's just a sentimental issue. 
Like we're not actually going to support their independence. It doesn't make any sense for us. So Monroe finally, I think reluctantly, has to stand down and has to publicly say the United States is not going to acknowledge Greek independence now. We will welcome them once they finally do secure it, though. I see two really interesting threads here. First, James Monroe was a secretary of state. He had held John Quincy Adams's job in the James Madison administration. So I would think that Monroe would have a pretty clear idea of the diplomacy of the era and what needed to be done. The second threat I see is perhaps a clash of generations. You know, Monroe had fought in the revolution. He fought at the battles of Trenton and Princeton in late 76, early 1777. He was wounded during those battles. And we have John Quincy Adams, who had experienced the revolution as a child and as the celebrated son of John Adams, who was himself a revolutionary statesman and president of the United States. So in some ways, I can see that we have this older generation, Monroe's generation, that may have been more sentimental about the revolution than the younger generation, which was John Quincy Adams's generation. Yeah, I think that John Quincy Adams was far more pragmatic about the situation and the possibility that the United States could feasibly support Greek independence. Greece's fate, of course, is wrapped up in a very complicated European political situation where you have Clemens von Metternich and other European powers wanting to prevent revolution from taking place. Britain has intense commercial interests within the Ottoman Empire. They look upon Russia with a little bit of suspicion. And of course, the Ottomans don't like the Russians. So it's a very complicated political scene. And I think John Quincy Adams was very much familiar with that. And also, that being said, wants to navigate that complicated scene and try to get the United States in a situation where they could feasibly get this commercial treaty secured. James Monroe, I think, is caught up in what was called the Greek fever or the Greek fire, as these early newspapers called, if I can go ahead and use that term. The Greek fire, I think, very much informed people that it was their civic duty because they survived a a revolution, they had secured independence, that because the ancient Greeks had so contributed to, again, and this is in their perceptions, that their own history and their legacy is directly connected with ancient Greeks that we must support the Greeks. Whereas John Quincy Adams would say, well, that's just sentimental and sort of silly. And while maybe I do want Greece to have independence, at the end of the day, that's not going to benefit our immediate concerns. Earlier, you made it seem like John Quincy Adams had a real uphill battle trying to convince Monroe and the other cabinet members that, no, they should take a pragmatic, diplomatic approach to the Greek Revolution They should not give in to their sentiments. And I wonder, how did Adams make this case and sway Monroe and the other cabinet members, and perhaps even members of Congress, that they should disconnect from their emotions and follow a pragmatic path that would lead to a commercial treaty? John Quincy Adams literally visits the members of the cabinet. He talks with members of Congress, especially when things really start to heat up when Monroe officially says we're not going to support Greek independence. That's, of course, his seventh annual address to Congress, where he famously articulates what we call the Monroe Doctrine. And within this speech, he says, we're not going to support the Greeks, but we wish them well, is essentially what it says. And John Quincy Adams had talked to, like, for example, John C. Calhoun had supported Greek independence. Other members of Congress are ardently supportive of the Greeks. Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, for example. Joel Poinsett also wants to support Greek independence. In fact, I think Poinsett pays John Quincy Adams a visit and says, hey, so just so you know, Webster really wants us to send some kind of agent to Greece. And I think we kind of need to do this because there's so much popular public support for supporting the Greeks. So we're going to have to basically do this. And Daniel Webster wants 
this classicist, Edward Everett, who frankly is like the American Phil Hellen. He's going to be in charge of a lot of the Phil Hellenic organizations nationwide. And so Poinsett says, like, we're going to kind of have to do this. And John Quincy Adams just really stood his ground and said, no, we're not going to do this. It makes no sense. In fact, I have a secret agent in the Ottoman Empire right now who is trying to negotiate a commercial treaty. And if we support the Greeks now, it's going to not only jeopardize our effort to get this treaty, but it's going to put people in danger. So we are not going to do this. I'm not going to hear this sentimentality. So yes, I think it was an uphill battle. And I think that he talked a number of people down from ultimately showing support. We keep talking about this commercial treaty between the United States and the Ottoman Empire that John Quincy Adams really wants. He thinks it's in the best interest of the United States to get this treaty and not recognize Greek independence. So we can better understand John Quincy Adams's logic on this. Would you tell us about this commercial treaty and why John Quincy Adams and I would assume a sizable portion of the United States really wants? American merchants had been within what was called the Levant. It's this eastern portion of the eastern Mediterranean. They had been there since about 1810, but there was no formal treaty between the United States and the Ottomans just yet. So how are they doing business then? Well, they are doing business because some of these American merchants had made an arrangement locally, but they're also having to sail under foreign flags. So for example, Russia allowed American merchant ships to sail under Russian flags. And this gave them some access to some of the trade there. But because they don't have this formal treaty, they can't sail under their own flags, they are limited as to what they're going to be able to do. In addition, there had been efforts prior to the Greek Revolution to secure a treaty, and it ends up kind of blowing up in their faces because Great Britain's diplomat at what's called the Sublime Port, this is the Ottoman court, the British diplomat had found out that the early Americans are trying to secure this treaty, and he basically puts the kibosh down on that. So they had made other efforts, and it hadn't panned out. So John Quincy Adams, and I think rightfully so, says, there's no way we can support Greek independence if we want to make this happen, if we want to open up trade in the Levant, and to be commercially competitive on the international stage. And I think that that was part of John Quincy Adams' vision for the United States in moving forward. So this is really why President James Monroe came out and delivered his famous Monroe Doctrine, which was a formal response that the United States wishes the Greeks well, but it is not going to interfere in the affairs of Europe, and it will not recognize Greek independence. Yeah, and he doesn't out and out say, well, we want this treaty, and so we're not going to support the Greeks. But he does say in this speech that, you know, he outlines the Monroe Doctrine, where he says essentially that the Americas are closed off to European colonization. And if Europe shows an interest in trying to colonize, we will view that as an act of aggression. And, you know, on the flip side, it also is we will not entangle ourselves in European affairs. So he is ultimately in saying that, explaining why they're not going to support Greek independence, because Greek independence is wrapped up in all of these other problems. Now, that was the official response from the United States, the formal response that the United States gave on the matter of the Greek Revolution. But there was also a more informal response from the American people as well. Maureen, we need to take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor. And when we get back, I'd love for you to tell us how everyday Americans reacted to the Greek Revolution and the type of response they had hoped the United States would issue. Hi, I'm Rob Parkinson, Associate Professor of History at Binghamton University. And my new book, 13 Clocks, How Race United the Colonies and Made the Declaration of Independence, published by the Omohundro Institute, is out now. This book covers the 15 months between Lexington and Concord and the Declaration of Independence. And we think we know that story cold. 
especially in 1776. It is a straight march from Thomas Paine and common sense through Thomas Jefferson denouncing the king in the Declaration of Independence. What I have found is we have forgotten so much of what happens in those 15 months and especially about the presence of African Americans and Native Americans in that story and then worries and opportunities about how we can exploit these fears and use that as a basis for this extremely fragile thing of unity. Get your copy of 13 Clocks, How Race United the Colonies and Made the Declaration of Independence wherever you buy your books. To order your copy of Rob Parkinson's 13 Clocks for the low price of $20, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash clocks. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash clocks. Maureen, how did everyday Americans react to the Greek Revolution? Were they happy that this trade agreement or possible trade agreement with the Ottoman Empire is what had prevented the United States government from formally recognizing Greek independence? No, the average early American was horrified that the United States government was not going to formally recognize Greek independence right away. So Monroe's address is printed in the newspapers in December of 1823. Days later, Daniel Webster takes the congressional floor and says, wait, what? Why are we doing this? I think we need to support Greek independence or at least send an agent. So I want to have this conversation. Also, we want to know if any correspondence has been directed towards the government from Greek officials requesting aid. So the Monroe administration then had to make public that, yes, Greek officials had been writing and had asked for assistance and ultimately are not going to answer those calls for assistance. So January of 1824, this is when Webster makes his famous speech on the congressional floor, appealing to his colleagues that the United States needs to do something for Greece. In the midst of all of this, early American communities had begun to organize philhellenic organizations. And to be fair, there already were some philhellenic organizations, but this is when the Greek fire, if I may, is ignited, where People are so shocked that their government's not going to support Greece when it's so obvious in their minds anyway that they should support Greece that, well, fine, if our government's not going to do anything, then we as brethren in this fight for independence need to provide that support. So you have, you know, of course, elites who are going to be giving speeches and appealing to people and appealing to their congressmen to support Greece. But we also have lots of examples of articles printed in the newspapers reporting that, you know, average people were donating significant sums of money, including just off the top of my head, I can think of an article printed where a barber in Troy, New York, had pledged that he was going to donate two days worth of income to the Greek cause. And there's many other examples a fire brigade in Washington, D.C. says that they're going to donate some funds to the Greeks. So this really does ignite a grassroots response in support of the Greeks. Perhaps this is part of why we call this era in United States history the era of good feelings, but it sounds like support of the Greeks and this grassroots movement to generate money and all sorts of aid for the Greeks and their cause for independence was really an activity that united Americans across the country. Yeah, and that's actually sort of a surprising thing in that we have to also remember that this is not long after the Missouri Compromise, where we are starting to see an increase in sectional tensions. And the Greek cause is one that both Northerners and Southerners seem to agree upon. For example, William Lloyd Garrison, who's, of course, quite young at this point in the 1820s, he supposedly had thought about at least going to Greece to join the Greek army. And he ultimately decides not to do that, but he does speak in support of the Greeks. So we have William Lloyd Garrison, the famous abolitionist. And then we also have John C. Calhoun, 
you know, champion of states' rights, also wanting to support the Greeks. So it was very much a nationally unifying cause. In your book, The Greek Fire, you make plain that Americans not only raised money to send to the Greeks, but that they also gathered and raised all sorts of goods and supplies that could help the Greeks in their war effort. What were the logistics of getting these goods and supplies to Greece where they could be useful? I mean, we are talking about a territory that is engulfed in revolution and in war. So things must have been pretty chaotic. And you didn't want these goods to fall into enemy hands. You wanted them to go to the Greeks. So how did the Americans get those goods to the Greeks? So at first... Donations raised by early Americans were collected and then sent to London to the London Greek Committee, which was sort of recognized as this major Philhellenic organization in Europe. Early Americans, of course, right from the get go, don't really like that idea of sending their donations to London for you know all sorts of reasons. But they also become convinced that the Greeks aren't going to know that their donations are being sent. They don't want the credit being taken by this London Greek committee. So then that gives rise to this need to have agents sponsored by these Philhellenic groups to get these donations to Greece. And there are a number of ships sent from the United States to Greece with supplies as an example of these agents. So Samuel Gridley Howe, for example, was a young man at this time, freshly graduated from medical school. He told his parents that he wanted to gain battlefield experience, and that's why he wants to go to Greece. And actually, I kind of enjoy this story because I have to imagine a young man who really wants the excitement of going to Greece. So no, mom and dad, I promise it's for educational reasons. But in reality, he's a Philhellen and wants to go participate in this important event. So Samuel Gridley Howe becomes an agent connected with some of these Philhellenic organizations. There's also Jonathan Peckham Miller, for example, is another American serving in the Greek army. They actually travel a few times between the United States and Greece, not only soliciting donations, they spoke to audiences talking about, we need to support the Greeks. This is what we're seeing on the ground. We need supplies. But then they also are traveling with the supplies back to Greece as well. You raise a really interesting point. During the American Revolution, you had Europeans, especially the French, sending all these really young, sometimes very old, military officers off to North America to fight on behalf of the American revolutionaries. This, of course, was highly problematic and tough for Congress to deal with, but it did yield the Marquis de Lafayette. Was there an American Lafayette type who? left North American shores, traveled back to Europe to fight for Greek independence and ended up kind of being a hero of the Greek revolution. Samuel Gridley Howe, Jonathan Peckham Miller, another man by the name of George Jarvis. These are the three men who really get a lot of attention for their positive influence and involvement in the Greek revolution. There were others, though, who maybe are lesser known. There is a supposedly a descendant of George Washington's who goes over, although he seems to have been a little less helpful <laughs> than Samuel Gridley Howe. But I would say Jonathan Peckham Miller and Samuel Gridley Howe are probably the most well-known to early Americans. And their letters that they write to these Philhellenic organizations are printed in newspapers. People would have recognized their names, known what they were about. And they certainly were thought of as being heroes, giving quite the sacrifice in serving in another revolution, obviously in a foreign land that most early Americans probably would never travel to. So early Americans really sent a lot of aid. They sent money, they sent goods, they sent both through American agents to revolutionary Greece, and they sent some men and military knowledge to the Greek revolutionaries. Maureen, Did any of this aid make a difference in the Greek Revolution? Did the Greeks secure the independence that they were fighting for? In the early stages of the Greek Revolution, efforts to raise donations are initially focused on the war effort. Very quickly, there is a little bit of friction there. Some groups, especially like Quaker groups, 
There's some pushback where they don't want to support military aid, but they are certainly in favor of supporting raising funds to aid Greek civilians. So we see a transition in the Philhellenic movement in the United States where it becomes very much a humanitarian venture. This also then allows women, for example, to get involved in the Greek cause because that would be an appropriate use of their time and energies where you have the benevolence movement in the United States, church groups, community groups where women are supporting widows, orphans, what have you. Well, supporting Greek civilians is in a way sort of an extension of that venture. So they appropriately then could get involved in supporting the Greek cause. So there is this transition in what is being sent and how they're going to support the Greeks. So the American Philhellenic movement is focused on trying to uplift the Greeks as a population to help them make their way through their revolution. That transitions into supporting building Greek schools because the feeling was how could they possibly enjoy independence and have a long sustained independence if they don't also have some sort of education on the ground. In terms of whether or not the Greeks gained independence, they did, but maybe not in the way that early Americans hoped that they would. So the Greeks formed an independent government in 1828, but their first governor of Greece, Giannis Capradistrius, was assassinated in 1831. So this calls into question just how stable Greece actually is. And again, we have to remember that Greece is part of this larger question in terms of European politics and wanting to keep stability in Greece. So ultimately, with the influence of these other European powers, Greece becomes a kingdom. And in 1832, a foreign monarch is placed on the throne. This is King Otto who had been the Prince of Bavaria. So early Americans wanted Greece to become a republic, and it doesn't really become a republic, at least at this moment. So early Americans had expected that Greece would create a republic in the similar vein that the United States had. So we actually have American revolutionaries in Greece, like Jonathan Peckham Miller, meeting with Greek officials and saying, we're not going to continue to support your revolution if you're going to turn to European assistance and accept a monarch on the throne. And these Greek officials, who must have known that they already were looking to entertain assistance from Great Britain, assured these Americans that, oh, no, we want nothing but to have a republic. And of course, that does not become the reality. Is this why in your book, The Greek Fire, you mentioned that this passion or Greek fire among the American people sort of fizzles out by 1828. Yes. So in terms of supporting a Greek Republic and all of the romantic sensibilities that circle around that, that fizzles a little bit. However, I would argue that the Philhellenic movement transitions a bit more into that humanitarian venture where we have American women like Emma Willard, who are supporting sending American teachers over to Greece to establish Greek schools, which they do. So that leads to sort of an extension of the Philhellenic movement where they're lobbying for interest and support to fund the construction of some of these Greek schools. And they print pamphlets, newspaper articles, advertising what they want to do, and to what level of success they had already established. And that continues into the 1830s. Did the fact that Greece's revolution failed in the sense that early Americans wanted Greece to become an independent republic, and it did not, it became a monarchy, did the failure to bring about a republic in Greece hamper American aid or temper Americans' responses to other revolutions that were happening during this age of revolution? That's a great question. and. I would love to do more research into that, but my attention kind of went towards looking at the consequences of the Greek Revolution on early Americans and how it influenced the reform movements of the time. So that's a great question. It's another project. 
Well, let's move back into your area of focus. What was the impact of the Greek Revolution and its outcome in the early United States? Beginning in the late 1820s, we start to see abolitionist groups expressing frustration with Philhellenic rhetoric, where they are repeatedly denouncing Ottoman rule within Greece, that we must support the Greeks to free them from as slaves under Ottoman rule. There's all this imagery about the Greeks being enslaved by the Turks. And again, it sort of fits into this trope that early Americans already had in their minds regarding what the Ottoman Empire is all about and what a Turk, quote unquote, means. So these abolitionists start writing, gosh, it's frustrating that we, on a daily basis, see early Americans condemning slavery in a foreign place, and yet we have slavery right here within the United States itself, and nobody seems to be bothered by this. So Philhellenic rhetoric is adopted in a conscious way by abolitionists. And in fact, they even say in some of these pamphlets, we need to look at how these Philhellenes are writing and developing their arguments because it seems to be resonating with people. So let's take that rhetoric and use it for our own purposes and try to shake people up and realize that slavery of any kind is wrong. And just because the Greeks are white shouldn't make a difference. So William Lloyd Garrison, for example, writes about this. David Walker's famous pamphlet addressing African-Americans directly makes this argument and says, just the other day, I was reading a, a newspaper where it's talking about how the Turks are a bunch of brutes because they enslave the Greeks and how terrible this is. And then right next to it was an advertisement for the sale of African slaves right here in the United States. And how can we live with ourselves? So this rhetoric becomes infused with the reform movement here in the United States. And in fact, it continues to be used for the next several decades. We repeatedly see this reference to slavery in other places, especially within the Ottoman Empire, and how it's not any different from slavery here in the US. And while I couldn't find any evidence that Southerners seem to make that connection. There's a, definitely a disconnect for them because in their minds, the Greeks are white and that is the difference. And there's nothing else to talk about because the Greeks are white. So of course they should be free and African slaves are black. So that's the difference. But for many other groups, especially in the Northern states, this argument does seem to persuade. And so by the time we get to the unveiling of the famous statue called the Greek Slave, created by an American artist, Hiram Powers. We're supposed to understand it's a Greek maiden who has been recently enslaved by the Turks and is on the slave auction block. She is nude and is about to be sold off. It's the first nude statue put on public display in the United States. So it's a little taboo because she is nude. However, early Americans were willing to accept the statue and to allow for the public to see it because she was, quote unquote, clothed in her purity and modesty and that this particular subject is being forced to be put on display. So people in northern states, southern states are really excited to see the statue. It makes a national tour. And abolitionists immediately seize upon this statue and start to say, how can you be so enamored of this statue when there are people put on the auction block every single day in uh, the southern states and you don't seem to be troubled by this? Frederick Douglass and his newspaper printed a number of articles condemning slavery in whatever form it took and lots of really moving critiques of the Greek statue, hoping against hope that Southerners, as the statue made its way into the Deep South, that perhaps they would look at this statue and would be moved by the situation that this young woman is in and to see that connection with similar young women enslaved in the American South. 
it sounds like a big legacy of American support for Greek independence is in the way that the Greek Revolution informed American debates about slavery and really the fulfillment of promises made in their own revolution, in the American Revolution. Right, precisely. That the Greek Revolution sort of takes early Americans out of themselves and makes them realize that the promises of the American Revolution have not been fully fulfilled is a moment of reflection. And these reform groups try to use that rhetoric because it had been so influential during the Greek Revolution in the 1820s that if that argument worked for early Americans to get them to support Greek independence, then why not try to turn that argument on its head and to try and get people to think about reform in the United States in a different way? Because perhaps it will turn some hearts towards the abolitionist movement. And I think it did. Now let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Maureen, in your opinion, how might 19th century trade diplomacy in American society have been different if the United States had formally recognized and supported Greek independence? So I think there are a couple of things here that immediately come to my mind. If the United States had recognized and supported the Greek Revolution, first of all, acquiring a commercial treaty with the Ottoman court likely would have at least been postponed. This may have prevented American merchants from furthering their presence in the region. For example, perhaps American involvement in the opium trade would have been affected. And that likely, of course, would have had significant consequences, both positive and negative. Diplomacy within Europe for the early Americans may have been affected by this as well. The Monroe Doctrine may not have borne as much importance as American intervention within Greece would have gone against Monroe's message in his address. So we likely would also then view foreign involvement prior to the 20th century in a very different light. Maureen, do you have a new research project that you're working on? Currently, I am working on a chapter for a larger project that is focused on a Greek revolutionary female by the name of Lascarina Bubalina. The book is a collaborative work with other historians who are looking at Bubalina's influence and legacy worldwide. The chapter that I am tackling is early American knowledge of Bubalina herself. And ultimately, I'm talking about how early Americans viewed female heroines So I'm looking at female heroines of the American Revolution, what early Americans expected female heroines to be like, and how Bubalina doesn't quite fit that mold. And so we're kind of troubled by her because early Americans seem to have wanted heroines to be beautiful and young. And Bubalina was older and not in the standard of a beauty that was accepted at the time. So I'm delving into early American perceptions regarding beauty and gender and what that says about their perceptions on female involvement in some of these revolutions. Speaking of Greek beauties, earlier you mentioned a statue. Is this a statue that we can go into a museum somewhere and see? The Greek slave, there are a number of copies of this. And there is one copy that is in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., but there are others, but one's at the National Gallery of Art. Thank you for that. That information is really helpful. How can we get a hold of you if we have more questions about the Greek Revolution and early Americans' responses to it? You can follow me on Twitter. My handle is M-E-C Santelli. I also have a website. MECSantelli.com. I have information about what I'm working on right now, also links to lectures I've given on my research and my work. So check it out. Maureen Connor Santelli, thank you for speaking with us today and for taking us through the Greek Revolution 
and early Americans' interest in it. Thanks so much for having me. The Greek Revolution offered Americans the opportunity to think about the role of the United States in the world and to think about their own revolution, the American Revolution, and the promises it made about freedom, equality, and the pursuit of happiness. By the 1820s, the American Revolution's promise of freedom and equality had gone unfulfilled for hundreds of thousands of Americans. And the Greek Revolution offered an opportunity to think through this situation. As Maureen discussed with us, abolitionists were thinking about the use of slavery in early Americans' ideas about the Greek Revolution. Americans kept talking about how the Greeks were the slaves of the Ottoman Empire. What did this language in comparison mean for the hundreds of thousands of Americans who were enslaved at home? One legacy of the Greek Revolution in the United States is how it forced many Americans to recognize that the injustices that they decried in other parts of the world were actually still happening at home in the United States. Another legacy of the Greek Revolution in the United States is how it made Americans think about the United States' role to play in the wider world of politics. In our 21st century, we often think of the United States as a world power, a country that gets involved in world affairs and takes a leadership role. But during the early part of the 19th century, this wasn't the case yet. The United States was still a relatively new nation and a republic in an age of revolution and empires. In the early 19th century, the United States did not have the military or economic might that it needed to back up its words and promises, which left questions in the minds of statesmen like James Monroe and John Quincy Adams about how to navigate a situation like Greece. In order to participate in world politics, the U.S. needed more economic power. It also needed more military power. A trade agreement with the Ottoman Empire would allow Americans to trade with the Ottoman states under the American flag. It would be a trade that would bring more revenue into the United States and help the nation in the 1820s and in the future. The alternative, of course, to seeking this trade treaty was promising the Greeks aid, which would risk a war with the Ottoman Empire and possibly with other European states. A war that the United States could ill afford to have. That would have spelled disaster for the still-fledgling nation. So John Quincy Adams advocated the position that the U.S. should focus on forging a trade treaty with the Ottoman Empire and finding a graceful, diplomatic way out of recognizing Greek independence. So Adams worked with President James Monroe and developed and wrote the Monroe Doctrine. This is a doctrine that sought to disentangle the United States from European affairs and to keep Europeans from meddling in North and South American affairs. This doctrine stated that the United States would not get involved in European affairs by, say, recognizing Greek independence, and it advised Europe to stay out of its affairs in North and South America. Of course, this doctrine, which has played such an important role in the history of the United States by the ways it shaped future U.S. diplomacy and involvement in the world, well, this doctrine was not a big deal in Europe. In fact, it was largely ignored by Europe. Still, the ways in which the Greek Revolution influenced the ways early Americans viewed slavery and reform at home and the United States' place and role within the wider world of politics had a very long-lasting impact in American diplomacy and in the American anti-slavery movement. You'll find more information about Maureen, her book, The Greek Fire, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash three, two, six. Today, we heard a bit about John Quincy Adams and his really influential role in developing key principles of the early United States' diplomacy. Now, our friends over at the Adams Papers Editorial Project at the Massachusetts Historical Society heard about this, and they offered us a few links so that we can take our investigation of John Quincy Adams' diplomacy even further. So on the show notes page, you'll find links to John Quincy Adams' digital diary, links to Adams' papers, and Adams' published writings on Greece and the Greek Revolution. Look for those links at benfranklinsworld.com slash three, two, six. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts, so please be a good friend and tell your friends about Ben Franklin's World. This episode of Ben Franklin's World is supported by an American Rescue Plan grant to the Omohundro Institute from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Jessica Brabble, Martha Howard, and Holly White. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com.
Finally, are there other diplomatic events that you'd really like to explore? Let me know. Your suggestions really help keep this podcast interesting. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation.